Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, senior film writer for Now Magazine, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Harvey Guillen, an actor you may have seen on shows like Documentary Now, The Good Place, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and Apple's Little America. He also played Benedict Pickwick on The Magicians, and these days, he's the not-so-secret weapon of FX's TV series What We Do in the Shadows, playing Guillermo, the human familiar to Cave and Novak's Nandor the Relentless. The show returns for its second season with back-to-back episodes this Wednesday at 9 p.m. I've seen them, they're great, and Harvey was able to join me between shooting them when the show was in town last fall. Harvey picked Titanic, James Cameron's massive historical romance starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet as star-crossed lovers who find one another in the midst of one of history's greatest disasters. An epic, a phenomenon, a megalith, Titanic was all of those and more besides cultural moment that conquered the world in 1997 and 98, and probably as a direct result of its success, it's become shamefully underrated for both its dramatic and technical accomplishments. We're here to do something about that, and apparently pitch a sequel. This is someone else's movie. Um, I was obsessed with the story of Titanic when I was little, just like read books, you know, when I was in third grade, and I did a report on it in fifth grade, and I was obsessed how this big, luxurious ship... Um, was doomed. Like it was just like the it, on its main voyage. I mean, the odds were like, what are the odds? And it's like, a, you know, growing up um, in a Mexican household, like it was like how much of it was like, you know, destiny or like it was like they were cursed. You know, there was yeah. a curse on the. I was like, there was a curse on the whole boat, and everyone suffered. Some, you know, because everyone was impacted. Even if you survived, you were somehow impacted with it. Sure. So I remember when the movie came out, I was like obsessed with it. Like I was, I snuck into it because remember there was that nude scene. And I thought I was doing something so bad. I remember like watching it and then watching Kate Winslet's bare nipple. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm not supposed to be watching this. <laughs> and I just remember watching it, but thinking it was done so tasteful. It was tasteful, nudity, you know, and yeah. I believe you are blushing, Mr. Big Artiste, um, was her famous <laughs> line. And I just remember thinking, wow, it's so James Cameron did such a great job of, you know, making this a uh, love story, but it's such an action packed film. And. Uh, I just, I loved it from beginning to end, and the special effects were beyond my wildest dreams at that point, you know, because I was just like, this is insane. Um, Yeah, and I've always been, you know, just drawn to, like, older um, storylines. I don't know why, even as a child, to become an old soul. I just feel like I watched, I watched, I definitely watched movies that I was not supposed to watch, um, like Peter Jackson's Heavenly Creatures was another one that I watched that I was not supposed to watch, and that one was too... (laughs) too heavy and I was just like whoa but I loved it I was like this is so cool and based on true story like it was you know that yeah. blew my mind so things that are based on true stories have always been my like you know jam I just love them so much and Titanic unfortunately uh, is the top one <laughs> I mean it is for a lot of people it's it's I don't know when it became a guilty pleasure maybe right after it was released and it was just embraced by yeah. teenage girls I think it was yeah it became such an international phenomenon that it became kind of um cliche to like it and it was weird because like that's the sign of a good movie if it's the biggest grossing we're well, not totally sent but like you know yeah. uh the, it, at that point it was the biggest thing in the world yeah. literally everyone yeah. knew it around the world you knew celine dion's my heart will go on uh if it came on an elevator you know without any lyrics because it probably couldn't get the copyrights but like <laughs> you know you yes. knew that song and the, yeah. i i sang that song at my eighth grade graduation Like, I remember, like, the story of me being in love with Titanic has followed me all through my (laughs) adolescence and, weirdly enough, still has stayed with me. (laughs) That's kind of lovely, though. I mean, it's, what is it, 22 years later. um, Yeah. I see it. I I run into it every now and then. I try not to watch it at home. It sounds dumb, but it's such a big screen experience. Yeah, you have to. It's a visual thing. I watched it several times, I think, uh, in the theaters um, just because it was beautiful. Like, it was like that scene with a boat and it's just like and people are sliding and for a second I was like that looks cool and at, at one point I think there was rumors that there was going to be a theme park oh, like a Jesus water Christ. theme park and a party was like that's terrible but also that's yeah. kind of great because I always wanted to slide down I the, was going to say everybody yeah. thinks that going to be the one that <laughs> yeah. makes it and I was like but that's in poor taste I have seen <laughs> I have seen inflatable uh, Titanics the, that are sinking oh, at, at kids parties or like at a, at a haunted maze thing I saw one last year in Los Angeles and I looked, I was like, is that Titanic, but sinking? And people go to the top of it and slide down like a slide. It's an uh-huh. inflatable Titanic. And I was like, I don't know. Maybe it, was like, it still felt like a, it was like too soon. I was like, it was 1912 when it yeah, happened. But is it too soon? We're almost at 100 years, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, we passed 100. I think it's a hair too soon. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it's, 
it's that weird thing where, yeah, people come out of this effectively it's a disaster movie, right? But yeah. they come out of it feeling so good that everyone's dead. Yeah. That finally, you know, because uh, yes, it's ambiguous, but she dies. Like that's the whole right. point. She's reunited with him on the staircase yeah. again, and all the people who were there are the people who didn't make it. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Like it yeah. works. And the, you know, just a position of like just a life, le- you know, well lived by someone who doesn't have uh, the means to travel and like living the best life to the fullest. Um, you know, growing up, like, you know, I didn't have money. I came from an uh, immigrant family, low income. So watching both worlds in one scene mm-hmm. was kind of really um I don't know, exhilarating to me because it was just like the potential of living a great life, not necessarily because money is involved, but because you choose to live the best life, you know? Yeah. And she the, embraces steerage and, and Yeah. And then when he says you're gonna go on and live and you have grandbaby and all that scene and and I remember thinking to myself, I was like, you, it's, he's so optimistic and he this guy is literally I can see it. You're you're dying, you know what I mean? You're freezing, you're in the water. It's a, the odds aren't you know, the odds look against you. <laughs> and here you are almost, you know, at your deathbed and you're encouraging someone else to live their life, which to me was kind of like a moment where I like I'm going to do that. I'm going to find a way to live my best life. And for me, that was acting and performing. And, um, you know, I've been able to do it. So, yeah. I yeah. think, I honestly think that James Cameron would be really happy to hear that. Yeah. Like, he really does. <laughs> like, he wears his heart on his sleeve for all the engineering stuff, for all the tech. Yeah. He he traffics in these big, broad emotional beats and, and the, the archetypal characters. I mean, yeah, okay. Italian best friend is... Just, you know, the there's got to be a better way to do Fabrizio. Right? Yeah, Fabrizio. There's got to be a better way to do that now. Yeah, because now that would not fly. The fact that he even flew then, like, it was like, it's me, Fabrizio. It yeah. was literally like saying, it's a me, a racial stereotype, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, you might as well just give him that line. And it was just, yeah, um, I think there's a better way of doing that, you know? Yeah. Um, but there, aside from that, he was really great at, like, if you look at the movie, he sprinkled, like, you know, in, in Titanic, there were passengers from around the world. And he sprinkled them as it, as the camera is like panning over through like the you know third class you know uh, state uh, rooms or whatnot, and you see um, uh, also you see like a Japanese man you know that like historically there's all these like stories of people who were on that boat they were very accurate to like what he kept and the old couple that goes back to the bedroom and decides to stay together those were actual real it's people the yeah. yeah and so like they just real stories that he found a way to incorporate to make it look seamless that was like oh yeah that was the person who was walking in the corner of my eye like really briefly you know yeah. but I was like he did the research and it was really great and also I was obsessed so I was looking for any details that I was going to say so how yeah. so how was that because I know that he was uh, Cameron was absolutely I mean I know I've, over the years of stories of, of how exacting he is and he's the guy who I've interviewed him a couple of times and I totally get where it all comes from he's the guy who knows he can do your job better than you right. and he still has to rely on hundreds of people to make his movies and I think on right. some level that really frustrates him but I know that he was psychotically obsessed with getting the crests on the on the dishes right. Yeah. And you can never see it. He actually you could, said so. You in, can't in, see in, it. But it wouldn't like, matter. It was he could see it. He needed it to be there. Yeah. Exactly. And then those dishes fall at the end when the ship, you know, starting to tilt and whatnot. Um, I, I love that stuff. I love details like that. Even if it's just for the actors, like, you know, uh, working on sets where the set, the costumes mean a lot to like, you know, bringing your character to life because it's the world you live in. And so I'm imagining like with Leo and Kate being in that boat and shooting in Rosarito, Mexico is where mm. they shot and they build this whole the giant aqua tank. Yeah. And, uh, and to be there, and to really because you're not you know obviously on the ocean you're literally on you know just a building uh, set in Mexico and uh, you have to feel like you are you know leaving Cherbourg or you're leaving you know Southampton and uh, I think it helps that everything around you looks like it's 1912 you it smells the the music it all adds to it. it just changes everything and so it makes it easier for the actor to fall into the character yeah and again that's something about Titanic that people kind of blew past is that the performances are really thoughtful and solid the 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 Romeo and Juliet of it the aspect of it of having this fictional character or this fictional couple running around the real life situation and the genius of Cameron's again the engineering thing where he shows us because he's got Paxton to provide all this exposition before the movie 
formally starts, but we get to see the wireframe model of how it's going to break down. And we realize about, I think it was my second time through, it's like, oh, they're always in the wrong place. They're exactly where things are about to go wrong. Yeah. So even if you weren't paying attention, even if you don't see it right there on the split screen, mm-hmm. your brain knows. It's like, oh, don't be in the kitchen. Yeah. I mean, like, don't, please the, don't do that. I mean, it's all for dramatic effect. Obviously, mm-hmm. they have to be um, in this, you know, the storage room where um, they almost get caught. And that was one of the things that I remember seeing that wasn't accurate that oh, yeah. I'm surprised James let it slide. But flashlights weren't uh, invented until 1913. And so when they have flashlights, yeah, the, bat, the big yeah. battery with the bulb, yeah. On it, that thing, and yeah. so that was like that was very uh, ambiguous because it was like, yeah, that was not that was ambitious because it was not it was like a year too early. State of the art on the Titanic. Yeah, everything is the future. So I think the only reason they probably decided they could have maybe they had so much money that they had the prototype. You know what I mean? Yeah. To like a, so I, I'm like okay, but uh, I think that is the 1913 was the year that That's flashlight. Amazing. Yeah. So when I see that happen, because you have to because those boys, you know, the the henchmen, I guess, with the yeah. security guards are like snapping and they see the handprint on the glass and they have to use a flashlight, you know, it's so dark and they're mysterious and they just got out of there in time. <laughs> and then two seconds later, those guys are dead because <laughs> they hits the iceberg in the water where they were two seconds before yeah. is gone. It's completely underwater, um, which only goes to show how many flight of stairs they had to go <laughs> yeah. within a couple of seconds before, you know, they, they keep missing death. Uh, by seconds and then eventually end up together. So, you know, what What better love story than that? Yeah, no, it's a great argument for romantic destiny. And, and I, you know, I got yelled at when I made this point in the 1997. It's like, it's the same story as Terminator. It really is. Like, it's one night. If you break it down. Everything is this perfect meeting of two people who are brought together by disaster and adversity. And, I mean, there's no time-traveling cyborg, although there might be. We don't see one, but that doesn't mean he's not there. It's not there. <laughs> the iceberg is the Terminator. I get it. Um, or the water. It's the liquid Terminator. Did yeah. Um, he caused all this. It's entirely possible. I kept waiting. You know, like, I was so hoping. And obviously, he wasn't going to do it because he was taking it seriously. But I was really hoping there'd be this one shot of Schwarzenegger as just like a, a steam and uh, Oh, wow. A, yeah. A guy just shoveling coal in the bucket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The lower decks going, everything's fine. And that's all I want. Just a little wink at the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He just made true lies. And yeah, yeah. They, they have a relationship. Yeah. No. No. It's all serious. Maybe. I mean, but, who knows? <laughs> yeah. I, so this is my alternate theory, which people hate. But structurally, like, it's ingenious. That's what I mean. Like, he understands how when the movie is, what, three hours and 17 minutes long, he can how? still find ways to hold off on the action. Nothing happens for, like, technically plot-wise, nothing happens 100 minutes in that isn't just about... Jack and, and Rose, but everything else, all these wheels are slowly turning and everything is moving towards it. And then when the iceberg hits, it all goes out the window and it just becomes about survival from moment to moment, which was so smart. And to, to not have an intermission too. It's like the roller coaster plunging right. you down. I think at that point it was the longest movie I, I've ever seen because I think I started watching Gone with the Wind when I was little and then I didn't finish it. Right. <laughs> I probably I really blame you. Yeah, not that age. Um, I saw it later and, and it was beautifully done and whatnot. But, but if you're um, a child. Yeah. If you're a child, it's not for you. And the fact that it was like the longest movie I'd ever seen in theaters and I kept going back to it just... It mm-hmm. spoke to, you know, how great it was. And I was just like, this is amazing. I went, and, I, and I was that weird kid at school just talking about it to my friends. And they're like, when are you talking about You know, because they're not into that. You know, yeah, they weren't yeah. watching Titanic. They were like watching like the latest like Pokemon, you know, like movie. And I was like, Titanic is so good, you guys. I mean, think about it. And they were like, wow, you're weird, Harvey. You know, <laughs> um, but I don't mind it because looking back, it was like such a great time. That's kind of how I was with Star Wars. But with Star Wars, when you're nine, everybody can get behind it. Everybody can get behind it. That's, yeah, see, at least that's the good, you know, you find your people. Like, I sure. feel like with Titanic, it was like I was talking to, like, middle-aged women about <laughs> Titanic. <laughs> and they were like, oh, you liked it? I loved it. I was like, why did you watch that? Why did you better close your eyes when that scene came on? And I was like, yeah, I closed my eyes when Kate Winslet is getting painted. You know, no. <laughs> I was like, it's no. Not, I mean, it, it is, it's tender, which is why it... it yeah, I've seen I've seen like it's... murals with more description, you know, and like more, you know, in history books well, in school, you know, that yeah. uh, that moment, such a brief tender moment, so it's like it was such a big deal, yeah. but uh, it I mean, was the, great. Even the sex scene is shot in such a way as to be kind of respectful, right? And, and uh, yeah, tasteful, age, age appropriate. Yeah, I, I think so. So I. Yeah, because even at that age, I was like, if that's how it's done, then I guess it's beautiful, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. at that age, I was like, okay, I'm not traumatized by it, you know what I mean? I'm not watching, like, an adult film or something, you know? It's just like I'm watching, like, people who are genuinely in love, and it's like, that is the outcome of love, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, um, 
And of course, then you have the opposite version of that, which is uh, whatever Billy Zane is doing, which I think is delightful. He's playing a character in a silent. I think that's his best like work ever. Like he's, I really think he's really great, and um, I'd like to see more of Billy Zane. Like you know, he's a talented actor. Yeah, just, he's he's really fun. Yeah, uh, he he's sort of. I think like he had this tiny little window where the eccentricity was perfect mm-hmm. for everybody. Like everybody got it. Dead, uh, dead calm. I was gonna say dead Zane. That was me. Mm-hmm. Uh, dead calm and the Tales from the Crypt movie he did, and he made this film called Blood and Concrete, where he's just sort of a kind of a criminal, kind of a hipster thief um, in sort of in 1991. And he's just he's great. He's yeah. delightful. But then he decided to shave his head and just go for it. Yeah, I don't know that when that transition happened, and that's the choice, and that's an actor's choice that he made. And about 1994, about um, 94, I was there. Yeah, uh-huh. um, I don't like. I just I, for me, he's always going to be Cal, you know, yeah. Oakley, and like it's just he's so good at that, like his like uh, voice inflection and his like you know diphthongs and his like speech pattern, like it's so perfect, yeah. and it's just like. You like lamb, right, sweet pea? You know, like those moments over the dinner table with Kathy Bates and just um, great acting all around. Just like yeah. uh, Kathy Bates, like, you know, um, it was just great. You're going to cut her meat further, you know, to Cal? Like that, just Kathy Bates to me is perfection. And what a perfect, unsinkable Molly Brown. Like yeah. they couldn't have cast that better. Like I can't even think, if they did a remake now, I can't even think if anyone could do that role that I wouldn't want to go back to just Kathy Bates. Can she do it again? Yeah, Francis McDormand. That's who, I would, that's who I would throw. I would like do this ridiculous overcast. Over, of yeah. Titanic. Well, that would be a very strong, like, I mean, a single Molly Brown, but like, I don't know. There's something like jolly about the way that Kathy played her. Oh, no, she's great. She's Bates great. Because she gave you like the truth, but she did it in a way where I was like, well, I'm not being mean, you know, just like, oh, yeah, tell him, tell him he's being like, you know, shoving his, you know, pig. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, she and Zane are basically allowing the audience to have fun with it. To just yeah. say that, you know, like, we're probably going to die. It doesn't matter. Play yeah. Us. I mean, we know yeah. Brown's going to live. And then but... she has her tender moment too when she's in the boat and she's like, what's the matter with you? You know, those yeah. are your men out there. And it's so, n- I remember watching that and I was just like, oh, she's really trying. And to show where like the level, even doesn't matter that you had money, but because she was a woman, you know, and she stood up on a boat and the man who just, you know, uh, part of the crew is like, and there'll be one less in this belt if you don't shot that all in your face, you know? And that the fact that um, one man was telling all these women on the boat what to do and wouldn't go back to help the people who need help because it's one man's decision. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the fact that even Unsinkable Wally Brown spoke up and even she was outnumbered because she didn't have the support of the, you know, the rest of the boat with her. They were all like, you know, living by the rules that these men were making. So it's kind of uh, very much like uh, the time, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what Rose is doing too. Like she's yeah. just by refusing to hang around with Cal and yeah. her mother to just go with Jack and learn things, be someone else and, and just, you know, dance in steerage and do all that stuff. She, she's, that's, I, that's what I love about Winslet's performance is that you, she, you watch her come to life you see her light up. DiCaprio has less to do as an actor. Like, he just, he's there to convince her to come and play with him. Right. Basically. Right. And the love stuff is between that sort of a duet. But in that first hour, she has, Winslet has so much going on that she doesn't show us. And then it all just kind of comes spilling out. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I knew, yeah, I'd it's, seen Heavenly Creatures. I knew who yeah. she was. And, and I didn't was. see Heavenly Creatures until after because I wanted to know who this actress oh, sure, was. Oh, right. That would make sense. And I was like, who is she? Because I was smitten. Like, I was just like, she did an amazing job. I was like, who is this actress? And anything that she would do, I would want to watch. Like, anything. Like, I was obsessed. I was just like, oh, my God, King Winslet. Like, so I haven't met her to this day, but if I did, I'd be like, I would, just, I would probably be weirded out. We, um, uh, we technically had dinner together. We were both a thing. Once, okay. And she was, uh, like, we were sort of at tables facing away from each other mm. but it's one of those people who you know where she is in the room at every given moment oh. like she's either because people are flocking to her and this would have been it was for little children uh, the 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 oh i love that Todd film Prada too film, yeah Todd Prada novel and todd uh todd field film. Mm-hmm. yeah it was the there was a party at the film festival and they invited all the film critics because they were basically just trying to make us love the movie but we already did so it was it's easy a great film and yeah and when she came in she was by herself she wasn't escorted but like you just felt this animal thing of everybody going, mm. like all the heads turned. Star power. Yeah, it uh, really yeah. is something. And that everybody else was there too. No one, you know, like poor Patrick Wilson. Uh, <laughs> I like him too. But yeah. Let's see, that's what I mean. There's just that aura of her, you know, that I think is so great. And it, it really uh, translates into the film with uh, yeah. one of the best introductions for a character is, you know, Rose's introduction with the hat oh, the and the way he shot. Yeah, yeah, and it's just completely raised up. 
and that in the music that in the score that he created for her, just that like crescendo into like a you know over a bird's eye view coming down and it was incredible like that's that's what filmmaking to me is like yeah. just done to perfection like it was like you thought of everything you thought of every second was accounted for it wasn't a mistake the music was aligned it was, like it, everything is just perfect yeah he really i mean he built it obviously from the ground up right but the the cost of it the scale of it yeah it's something that we really hadn't seen for a while i mean i think the year before there was the english patient which mm-hmm. is an epic, but an epic produced on a budget. It's yeah. very clearly working with specific constraints and yeah. even to the fact that they pared down the book and took out all this other stuff. And, and that was the right call because it makes the movie yeah. a straight line instead of a sort of Jeremy Baramy thing. Right. Curly and then that's the time where like studios aren't doing the, you know, they're not doing Cleopatra where like they're, everyone's on location and yeah. then building sets and leaving those sets to hit weirdly enough feel like they've become part of history you know in those uh location um that they shot at but this was like something that it was either going to pay off or it was going to be a flop you know and kudos to everyone who just you know supported it and gave it uh whatever extra money that it needed to be done because it, i can't imagine it. if it wasn't done to its fullest potential then maybe we wouldn't be as obsessed with it than i am yeah you know? no i think so i think so i think it, it comes down to yeah i mean it's always cameron's vision right because yeah. that was the other thing that fascinates me about him up until maybe even still, because I don't know how much the Avatar sequels are going to cost, but they won't be cheap. Right. But between, but they've proven themselves at the box office. Yeah, I think yeah. everything's profit at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but but between, I want to say the Abyss, so the Abyss, Terminator Two, True Lies, Titanic, and Avatar have all been the most expensive movie ever made. Like every time he makes a movie, it is the most expensive movie right. ever produced because he's building the technology and he's just also doing. He's confident enough that the the money will be there. He just keeps going, and I i actually, I always forget this happened. I ran into him. He was here doing press for Titanic, and it was whatever week Alien Resurrection opened, so the week before or two weeks before, mm. and he was at that screening because um, my tick is that I just don't leave a movie. Now, of course, everybody stays to see if Nick Fury shows up and invites the Transformers to join the Avengers, <laughs> but at the time, it's like I would just watch the credits. I, I like credits, and... He was the only other person still watching the credits. Like the lights come up at the very end and it's him in the, uh, it's this old, beautiful old theater of New York that had a balcony. And I was up in the balcony and he was down in the orchestra and the lights come up and he's tall. So he stands up and it's just like, oh, that's, that's James Cameron at an alien movie. <laughs> hang on. You, hang on. So I just had to. I mean, we were both leaving together. Yeah. And I just kind of walked up and went, I, I don't want to be rude, but you know, what did you think? And he's like, eh, it's not the movie I would have made. <laughs> and then I realized, like, later, he's two weeks away from opening Titanic, maybe even only one week away. I have no idea what day it was. I should look this up. But he was so relaxed, and he wasn't panicking or worried. The film was done. The work was done. He, But also, he wasn't sweating it, which is like this gargantuan monster thing where, for the first time, really, he's put his entire heart out, and he's just, eh, you know what, I'll go see an alien movie. And and the fact that he could just come up with a flippant response, like he wasn't panicking or shocked to be recognized. Yeah. Nothing like that. It was just this – he was so calm. It was eerie. I've interviewed him a couple of times since and he's all – it turns out he's just always pretty calm. Yeah. But – I would imagine you have to be after – I mean he – it's like uh, that's the, you know, the smallest of uh, – the things he has to worry about, I guess, at any given moment. Yeah. It's just like, I mean, if the film is like something that you're focusing on with the budget and building sets and sound, then just having like a real conversation about the project is probably like the, you know, cherry on top. They're just yeah. like, this is the easy part, you it's know? True. The only time I ever see him is when the work is done. Yeah. And so we don't see that, you know, the master at work behind closed doors, yeah. if you will. So the stuff they don't talk about, the, the, the stuff they refuse to talk about in the documentaries. Right. Because then it would make it seem like, whoa, why are you doing this to yourself? You know, why are you killing yourself or by making people. this? Yeah. But then it's also because it gives, you know, the rest of the world uh, that uh, piece of art that will live forever, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of cool to think about it because here we are talking about that film, you know, yeah, that yeah. he worked on for a couple of years and it is still, it's part of our, you know, uh, you know, just history. Like, it's yeah, so yeah. cool. Tied for the most Oscars ever. It's like, not only did it make people happy and, and make all the money in the world, it, it's like, it's a full on across the board success. It, he, yeah. I mean, I remember 
when he accepted the Oscar and he said, I deserve this. Let's party. And it's just like, yeah. yeah. After the moment of silence, that came kind of weird. <laughs> but I think that's part of it too, right? Like yeah. he's so far into the the thing that it becomes abstracted that it isn't right. really about Well, I think he doesn't look for validation. And it comes to the point where it's like it could be a borderline of like it's not being cocky, but it's also like he knows he, da- he does really damn you know good work and mm-hmm. he knows that he – yeah, he got the Oscar because he he probably would say if he didn't get the Oscar that he was cheated. You know what I mean? Because yeah. he does the work, and I think everybody who puts their heart and soul into something it thinks it's that's their baby. You know, so they that their baby's the best baby, and <laughs> you know, in the nursery, and uh, and when it doesn't get picked for prettiest baby, that's when the problems start. You know, yeah, but yeah. but I, I'm glad that everyone's you know uh, procreating the most beautiful babies they can. I was wondering and, where you're gonna take yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> and they put the work into it. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, and dude, so, your baby broke in half and killed 1,300 people and there's an iceberg stuck in it. It's like, yeah, but it's the most beautiful baby. baby. It's my <laughs> baby. You know, no one talks bad about my baby. Yeah, so I yeah, I love that film so much. And I think about all the characters. I, people have tried to make like Titanic, like sure. not like spinoffs or anything, but like their own version. It's never, never right. You know, it's just like they don't have the budget. So you could just tell the costumes are just not as high end or, or the, the music or it's cheesy or the storyline. And I feel like if they redid Titanic, I, I would want to be like playing multiple characters in the background, just like <laughs> Miss Trudy, who like comes in for tea and like helps when Rose gets in an argument with Cal and like you know in the veranda and like yeah, picks there. up the tea. He's like, I got it, Miss, you know, and it's me dressed as Miss <laughs> Trudy. And then of course when she's sliding down the thing, I feel bad for Miss Trudy. I feel really bad because you know he's uh, Rose's mom sends her back to the room to turn on the heaters. Um, because this is all ridiculous, the ship's not going down, it's the unsinkable ship, and then you know as the audience, she's going to die, you know, she's going back into the room, the ship's going down, you know, and no one ever goes out and, and tries to get Trudy until it's too late, and someone's like, hold on, Miss Trudy, and she's holding on to the edge, and then she slides down, you know, the whole outside of the ship. Um, I always felt bad for her. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, it's again the the wealthy. That's part of the cynicism of the age, right? The mm. wealthy survive in luxury. Cal steals a baby. I'm all she. Uh, I'm all she's got. Yeah. yeah, which is again total dick move, but yeah. absolutely something Donald survival Trump mechanism. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. If they recast that role, it'd probably be like <laughs> Donald Eric. Trump. It's Eric Trump. It's not even one of the good Trumps. <gasps> yeah, if it would, yeah, and you wouldn't have to tell them to act. They just say, just say these lines, you know, yeah. and they'd be like, oh, and it would just sound. Take the baby. Which one doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just yeah, you just say the lines. It'll sound perfect and evil. So yeah. it'll be perfect. Yeah. So who would you? I mean, if you do recast it, who would you put in the leads? Who is oh, capable wow. of playing those roles now? That is. Gosling and McAdams are a little too old. I would say, uh, yeah. If this would have been done, um, Stone or still. Mm, Emma Stone could wear the hat. Yeah, Mr. Will look great in the hat. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Rose is um, 16 at that age. Yeah, you need, age. To, be you need to be young. And yeah, so we would need someone who can play 16 but has the chops, you know. So I don't know if we have a 16-year-old actress who mm. could maybe – um, yeah. maybe 22, like playing 16, but like, who's, yeah, and but I can't the, think of that actually. So I'm like, oh, that's great. I mean, I'm trying to, but oh, no, worry about it. There's a uh, long, well, like, uh, um, long way to go there. Who would you? I don't know. I, I think it would have to be an unknown. I think you would have uh, to make you have to discover someone. Risk, yeah. someone who hasn't already, you know, like co starred with Emma Thompson in an ugly adaptation of Jane Austen, right? Some total new face and yeah. you have to trust that it works right and for but Jack, I do like that idea of Rachel back like if this was like maybe 15 years back or 10 years back like right after you know um, maybe 10 years like yeah I would see Rachel McAdams still playing that role she would do great she would be great. She'd be great yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, local Canadian <laughs> Just that we have we have a good talent pool here you guys have a great talent pool but I don't know who what about Jack oh man there's so many like just teeny bop heart throbs that I wouldn't want to like give it to someone who can just look the part and maybe carry the role I think Leo really did dive in although he does a great job in um, what's eating Gilbert Grape and I think that's some of his um, you know top work there but um, and that was younger than Titanic so he was yeah, yeah. he was already proving his chops I think well, I, I heard a story that like Romeo and Juliet too, yeah right? see so he was picking his he was really selective and I appreciate that because I think I, I heard that at one point he was offered Hocus Pocus which was a kids film yeah and it was between that and i th- i think it's what's eating gilbert like what it was oh. that film or something and then 
I think someone was advising him to like do because it's like a Disney film and that's your genre. You're like your teenage uh, followers and whatnot. But he saw the bigger picture. And I think um, that's the story that I heard. And I was like, always like, wow, that's kind of really cool because it's easy sometimes to take the role that um, is popular, you know, and be like, well, this is everyone's going to see that. And this is more like drama and it'll be like very niche, you know, and it's like I would always go for the challenge. It doesn't matter what the eyes are going to be watching just as long as you're comfortable and, and doing the best work forward and presenting that. Yeah. Well, I mean, and he'd already, I think he'd already done this boy's life by that point too, mm-hmm. when he would have had that choice. And that's like, that's a fearless performance mm-hmm. opposite, like maybe the last great De Niro performance. Yeah. And you see that. I mean, I remember watching that film and coming out of the theater and going, oh, okay, he's a movie star. Like that, yeah. that kid I've never seen in anything before is never going away. Yeah. He's amazing and he's got range. And then he kind of, and he kept on delivering on that. And then, you know, like 10 years, he sort of, between maybe, let's say, Blood Diamond and, and The Revenant, where he was sort of aggressively chasing awards performances and yeah. how much stress can he put himself through. And then since The Revenant, I think he's become a more interesting actor again. Like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, I have issues with the film, but he's not one of them. He's he's great. He's terrific and he's relaxed. Yeah. Yeah, there's something, but you're right. After The Revenant, like something happened where like it was like a check mark that was like, he, of course, you know, actors work their whole life and it's great if you do get accolade after you know a certain project went. so I think that was one of those moments where like it was a check mark and I was like now you can got what you want you know yeah. and now you can you know drop Go. your guard enjoy and just do fun and have fun with the characters and um, which he was before but I'm saying that like you know as an actor I can see why it's like a career like you know strategy and whatnot. Sure. but um, I think you're right after that it was kind of like I like him and the stuff he does it seems like he's just really falling into the characters easily yeah. yeah, I mean, even the reunion he did with Winslet in, in uh, Revolutionary Road, mm-hmm. it's fine. Yeah. I just don't, you know, Michael Shannon's the most interesting thing in that movie. And yeah. He's only in it for three scenes. I just like them together, Kate and him. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. It is, like, people I'm, clearly respond. They're, they're, they every now and very then much photographed respond. somewhere together and yeah. the whole world goes, oh. Yeah, it's just something about a nostalgia or the fact that maybe subconsciously we want them to be together. Yeah. Like well, we it's want the love to... they never got to live. Right. right? Like, so I wouldn't be surprised if we all just like are like complete awe that in like a couple of years they end up together for some reason, <laughs> and then we're and we're and that's gonna be the biggest like love story be- inside of a love story, outside of a love story film. You know, like right. it's gonna be this huge thing where like someone has to write a story about that, and then like it's gonna be that like, we a, met on the set of Titanic. That's a really good interesting like, angle for a story. Yeah, like, just some fictional version of that. Yeah, be really that'd be cool, right? Because what is it like to be that famous and that bonded by an experience that was yeah. potentially like traumatic. And also I feel like the time was never right for them. Like they could have been together. And I just feel like something is like, you know, Kate was married and um and different was, relationships. And DiCaprio and, won't date anyone over twenty six. <laughs> that might be the issue. That might be the I don't know. I feel like at the end of the day, like you if you love someone, like it might find its way back. Like it's like I don't know. I, I'm still a romantic heart with You're them. Holding You're holding, holding it out. I'm holding out. I'm torch. holding out for them and I'm just thinking that you they're gonna be like fifty and like they're gonna be like on a cruise somewhere and they're gonna be like, Remember when we shot that movie? And it's like, let's do it. Let's just get married. We belong together, you know. And, and then, then the they, boat sinks. This and the is boat a horrible sinks. future. Like, no, you've given I, them. Okay, I never said the boat sinks. You said that cruise. Was, I said cruise. We never said like the boat sinks. Like, I mean, it I, has to. Now. No, it doesn't. It's like the, they, this boat makes it to the dock. <laughs> they get off and they get married, and we all hear about it, and we all cheer and celebrate in the streets. Uh, see, I picture it happening. The, the, the reconnecting is over. Uh, I don't know why, but I have this ridiculous Florence Nightingale setup where he tries to do something extreme for a role, like eat another bear's liver, and he gets food poisoning, and oh, she's no. right there and can help him. Oh god! And I don't know why. It's like it's maybe it's the English patient. It's another kind of thing. Yeah, where they they recover. I thought you were gonna go and like be tragic and say they were on that cruise ship, and then oh, no, when, no. as soon as they admit their love to each other. The cruise ship goes down or something and no one survives and it's like, no, that would be the biggest tragedy. That would be fascinating. What if that, what if you tell that story from the perspective of just like an engineer or a food food server on the boat who just gets to witness all of this? Yeah. That's where you have the ingenue. Right. Taken under somebody's wing and then they watch this and then tragedy strikes. Yeah. And the ingenue saves, but can the ingenue can only save one. I guess that could be the chef on, uh, because the chef survived. Because okay. he was so intoxicated in real life. Um, really? So that was, that's that was a real story. Mm-hmm. From Titanic, the actual chef um, knew the boat was going down and was like, well, it's going down. So started drinking really and like within two hours, drank so much alcohol 
that his body temperature was just heated to antifreeze. Yeah. Oh my god. And so he was in the water and got and survived. And so the fact then the chef is there, remember where like they're walking out and they're at the edge and the boat's already like kind of perfectly like like bobbing like a corkscrew. Mm-hmm. And you look she looks over to her left and she sees the chef. The chef is on the side of the boat already. He's on the edge too. Yes. And then they go under. And then so James is really smart about putting that in there because he did survive. Like he just thought it was going to go down. So he just got wasted. He was like, well, we're all going down. We might as well enjoy it. So he kept drinking and drinking. And then he survived. When he gave it up. He threw in the towel and said, we're all going to die. I'm just going to drink myself to death and survived. See, that's the story I want for the sequel. That's the story. Someone I, trying it. That's what I should do. I should pitch that. I should play the chef. You can play the chef. Yeah. And then everything through my eyes, my, my intoxicated eyes. I think that could be really great. <laughs> it's increasingly, and you know, the best kind of drunk performance is the one where someone is struggling to keep it together. Right. But if this guy has already decided that his life is over, he's yeah. going to have the best time. And also it's his perception. So what does that look like through, you know— Bleary, <laughs> all poison. Yeah, like things are not what they seem. And it, do I start talking to a giant rabbit? You know, and it's sure. just like, but it's not the lady with the hat. And like, there's just all these elements that could happen with that. I want to see this now. Yeah, like there's got to be a way. We're pitching this. We're going straight to yeah, Fox. Fox. Yeah, Disney. they'll take it. Yeah, they own it all now. It'll be on Disney Plus next year. <laughs> <laughs> what would you even call it? <laughs> Titanic two, T O O. Yeah. S S uh, R M. Titanic 2, SS. R- RMS Drinky Ship. RMS Drinkies. <laughs> I would actually watch the show. RMS. <gasps> it's just a hiccup. <laughs> That's right. They can't, they can't call the Carpathia because they're t- they can't yeah. get you, to the radio room. You can't, can't well, actually just can't words. really function and do oh, it. Of course, because yeah. it's Morse. Yeah. <laughs> so his, his yeah, SOS. Yeah. yeah. And it's, all they're saying is like, good night. Yeah. Shut down your systems. It says DNR. Does that mean we should leave them alone? Yeah. That's another horrible side of the story that there was a boat a few miles away that could literally see the lights of Titanic. And because of all the first class passengers trying to send messages back home that they were arriving early, mm-hmm. um, it overpowered the system. Or not overpowered, but it was so annoying to just hear their messages and they just turned off the machine. Yeah. And so the idea that I was like, you were, don't turn off your machine if it's annoying, then just, you know what I mean? But like, don't turn it off. Like, so many people could have survived. But then again, then we wouldn't have a movie. So, yeah. Well. <laughs> Historical tragedy does lead to contemporary entertainment all the time. All the time. Uh, Chicago. And, yeah, right. <laughs> also shot in Toronto, so there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Cameron said he thought about including the Carpathia, mm. um, but he he was just it would be too distracting. He, he yeah. To, at that point, you're going. The story's going so well yeah. that if you throw in another fact like that, like it was just why why did we need to you know yes it adds a, adds another layer, but the movie's already so long. Yeah. And he said he need, wanted us to feel hopeless with. Rose mm. at that point, like to have her because blowing the whistle, you don't want to be thinking about, oh, the boat will hear it. Yeah. You want it to be empty. Mm. No and, hope. And yeah. just that, um, and have that with her. That's that's smart. See, genius at work. Yeah. He knows how to do this he stuff. He knows what he's and doing. Just breaking the whistle out of the ice and the whole, that whole struggle to rally herself. Again, it's amazing to me that she didn't win. Like the actors do yeah. in Oscars for this. And I know there are other things happening in the world and, and As Good As It Gets was embraced for being the more realistic thing. Although in the rearview mirror, eh, not so much. Not so much. But it is like there is a specific type of performance that you need to give to be that transparent in a, in a movie this big and to still feel like you're a character rather than a, a, a stock character mm-hmm. or a puppet. And DiCaprio is good, but Winslet is great. I think Winslet should should have won. I, I I honestly do. I think that, I think the movie got so hyped um, that it became so commercial in a way that people oh, yeah. were kind of you know oh well, that's not really art, is it? Yeah, you know, it can't it's, be that good. It can't be that good. If everyone loves it, something's wrong. You know, and it's like no, it, maybe it's maybe it's that good. Maybe this is as good as it gets. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, and, here in in uh, obviously in Toronto, the the big story was that. We had two Canadian nominees for Best Director and, and uh, Adam McGoyan was up for The Sweet Hereafter. And the Toronto Film Critics Association, I think it was our first year, gave him the prize, our, our Best Picture Award. And I I liked The Sweet Hereafter, but I voted for Titanic and, and I'm proud of this. And I was kind of mocked a little bit, I don't mind saying, mm-hmm. uh, for my enthusiasm. It's like, no, it's just a great movie. Like it's a beautifully engineered piece of – Commerce. It is absolutely a commercial film, but it's yeah. also art, and it is so. Like if it if the ending didn't land, if I if if 
somehow, and we haven't even mentioned Gloria Stewart, if that stuff uh-huh. wasn't there to connect, she's got three chunks of film to stitch those performances together with Winslet's and the two of them, and then you know, like they're both nominated for the same character, which almost never happens and never has happened in the same year. And it's just, it's this gentle little poetry that puts all the big stuff into focus, right? Like we get to see the legacy of Titanic in this woman, in this fictional character, but we also have the entire legacy of Hollywood because she was a, 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 an ingenue and a star in, in the olden days mm-hmm. and this, this continuity that it creates. And again, he's just, he's a genius to, to come up with that structure and have Paxton there to sort of be her audience and take it all in. He's a, like, she's as much an exposition machine as, as he is mm-hmm. in those scenes. But just the way he puts it up, like Paxton just puts it all aside and, and just listens. You don't have to do that no. in those movies. And he chose to get that. Yeah. It's, such a good film. I moved again. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go back and watch it in the big theater, please. Yeah. When I was the last time you saw it? I think I saw it for the anniversary. Uh, I was playing limited in theaters in L.A. And I went to see it. I think I saw, I saw it by myself because I was trying to be nostalgic. And that's kind of what I did when I was little. I snuck into the theater by myself, and um, which was weird. And no one thought a child sneaking in and watching Titanic by themselves. I guess that's one of the films that they weren't looking out for kids to try to sneak yeah, into. They were like more like the Halloween or the I know which did last summer yeah, or Scream, and they're looking for right kids there, yeah. to like. They, I walk right past that and went straight to the Titanic. They're like, oh, that one. Okay, he must be accompanied by. Yeah, it's like the, his parents must be inside. They dragged that poor kid into watching that film, <laughs> um, which I played really well. I was like, yes, that's exactly what it is. No, um, but I uh, that was the last time. I have the limited edition with the collection of. Uh, behind the scenes and all that. And it's always fun to like, I love behind the scenes stuff. I love when actors talk about the process or when you see clips of them in the giant water tank Mm -hmm. um, and Kate making fun of like, you know, it's like you're walking around and it's like, it's cold water. And then all of a sudden it's warm water, warm water, you know, and it's like trying to get away from it and just stuff like that where just like um, those moments will live forever with them as a performer, but they'll also be shared with us through like limited, you know, um, features. Yeah. It's so great to watch. Yeah, no, special editions are great for that stuff. Uh, I think the last time I saw it... Oh, yeah, the last time I saw it, it was in 3D. Have you seen that version? No. It was, I want to say, 15 years later, and it was mostly just Cameron doing it because he could. Mm. It's like, look, I can do a 3D conversion that actually works because I know he's seen a few that he doesn't like. Yeah. And so he obviously solved the problem for himself and figured out a way to do it, and it actually works. Mm. It mostly... I mean, it works for everything. It, it's It's a good spatialization, I guess is the word, but they, they separate the images and it makes it work as a, a, a proper 3D experience, even in scenes where people are just sitting still and in a room. Mm. But what really worked for me, surprisingly, wasn't the height of the, of the boat disaster part, but the absolute isolation in the water. In the end, mm. you're just in this deep black and it goes on forever. And it landed in a way, I mean, I'd seen the film maybe three or four times already theatrically by then, and it landed in a way that really hit me. It's like, oh, this is this is what he wanted. Different feeling. Yeah. yeah that like you felt. this, this yeah. absolute hopelessness. Yeah. And, and the, like the, the individual pieces of ice are floating and you can tell how far away they all are. And it really worked. And again, he spent... Did they make the theater colder at that moment? Yeah, that would have been... That would have really, really... Slowly yeah. crank the air conditioning. Yeah, the last hour that would have been smart. Yeah. Somebody must have By been. hour three, it was just freezing in that theater. Yeah. That's the way it should have... Okay. We should get them to do we that. Gotta, yeah, here. here we go. Yeah, We're pitching a new idea. Yeah, there, we'll do that for the sequel. We'll okay. Do that for the two. Yeah. <laughs> yes, RMS Drinky. <laughs> I'm Drinky. Um, but yeah, they, there's an IMAX version now, which is properly formatted. They did the DMR process. It's at Cinesphere every now and then. I'm assuming you're going to catch that if you can. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's still like it just it's not the same at home it, it really I yeah. know TVs are bigger now but and I think the only thing I saw at home is the special features because that's stuff you can watch you know, yeah. it's just a fun little like snippet I don't want to watch the whole film probably at home because yeah it's no. a different kind of commitment you don't want your phone ringing in the middle of it. three three and a half hours it's a lot of time yeah. <laughs> want a sensory deprivation tank and a screen the size yeah. of I'll do that That'll yeah work. so um the, this is kind of, I think we kind of maybe already covered it, but the, the final question on the podcast is always the same, which is, is there anything from Titanic that you have used yourself or borrowed or incorporated or outright stolen and, and just used for your own work? Yeah, I think I would say, hmm, like I said, I really like the performances of all the actors, especially the characters like Molly Brown and 
um, by Kathy Bates and, you know, and also Cal. Um, just the character work and development of doing work. Um, I play character parts a lot and um, to be true to them and to, you know, even if it's a comedy, um, it has to be grounded and it has to be real. So when it's uh, funny, it's organically funny and it's not shoved down, you know, your throat. And um, so I remember watching that movie at a young age and knowing that I want to be an actor. And then as I got older, uh, using it as a reference a lot just because I wanted to, um, the work is so brilliant. Um, I take every character, I do whatever it is, comedy or drama, and really get to the core of the character. And I think for me, looking at how great those performances were, um, reminds me of like what really great work um, and character work can look like. Yeah, I would just encourage people who haven't seen it in a while to go take another look at it. Yeah. It, not only does it hold up, it's, it's really good. It's, really it's good. Just, it's a good history lesson too. A lot of the facts are in there. Yeah. You like history too. The thing I have held back for this entire episode is that my, my wife, uh, Kate, is a massive also Titanic fan. And now I don't know if she knows the story about the chef. She must. She must. She's going to kick me for even suggesting she doesn't. <laughs> but it's like I'd never heard that. And she was, well, the last time we watched oh, – the last time Titanic was, was around, I don't think we've ever seen it together. But the last time the 3D release came out, she was kind of diving back in. There's a, there's a book of recipes – uh, from from the menus. The oh right, menus. I actually, actually have, have a uh, tea towel. I have a copy of um, the second class uh, dinner menu, which is like really cool and like just it's this package I got when I went to Belfast because the ship was built in yeah. Belfast, so they have this museum for Titanic, so I had to go, and they have all this memorabilia like um, you know replicas of like everything the 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 actual soap that they used in first class the company's still around huh. and they make little um, squares the way that they would have packaged them for the first class passengers and so you have that and you have um, the actual uh, posters that they were around town to buy your tickets how much was tickets uh, the menus like all that like really cool little things and trinkets and I have those um all on display in my bathroom. Aww. Yeah. It's a shrine. It's a little shrine. It's like, well, my whole bathroom is like aquatic. Thing, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like seashells and Titanic memorabilia. You're kind of asking for trouble. Yeah. I'm worried about it. I don't it's know. Flooding. I guess well, it's only going to you're owning that bathroom. <laughs> yeah, that's You've isolated. You've contained yeah. it. <laughs> as long as you're not in there, you're fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's a great movie. Still holds up. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you picked it. I was... I was Kind of hoping someone would someday. It's, <laughs> oh, really? I'm yeah. the first one. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, wow. we've done Aliens. I think that's the only other Cameron film that's come up. But mm. uh, yeah, no, I'm really glad you picked Titanic. Yeah, and I was torn because I think subconsciously I was like, well, oh, everyone's going to think it's such a cliche to pick that movie because like ah, I really like it and I, I'm not, I have no shame in like saying that I like it, you know. So there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure. If yeah. you like something, it's it's for a reason. Yeah, yeah, it connects. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> My thanks to Harvey Guillen who returns as Guillermo in the second season of What We Do in the Shadows this Wednesday, April 15th at 9 p.m. on FX. And again at 9.30. There's two episodes. Don't miss them. And you'll see him in the Quibi series Don't Look Deeper, which I understand is coming soon. Thanks also to Corrine Delage. She knows what she did. You can find Harvey on Twitter at Harvey Guillen, all one word. And you can find Titanic on Blu-ray and DVD from Paramount Home Entertainment. It's also streaming on Netflix, Amazon Prime, and Hollywood Suite in Canada, and available for rental and purchase on iTunes and Google Play pretty much everywhere. And yes, I asked. Kate did know the story about the chef. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, and elsewhere on the internet at NowToronto.com, where in addition to my film duties, I'm hosting a new podcast called Now What? Interviewing Torontonians about our weird new normal of self-isolation in the age of a pandemic. You can find it Tuesdays and Fridays in your podcatcher of choice, and you can also find this podcast on Twitter at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. Our theme song is by The Last Year. If you like it or you're enjoying the show in general, please say so. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network. Jordan Heath Rowling's The Big Story is absolutely essential listening right now. Thanks for your support, and thanks for sticking around. Stay inside. Watch movies. I'll see you next week.